afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, I'd like to dedicate this talk um, both to two giants of ubiquitous computing, uh, Gitana Borrello and also Mark Weiser. Um, I think when you're an undergraduate at university, you don't realize that there's a, a wealth of relationships that get built in graduate school and later on as a professional. And ubiquitous computing, which um, was sort of the subject of uh, Mark Weiser's research and also Gitana's research, <coughs> roughly from the beginning of the 90s um, through to um, the mid-2000s, although sadly we lost Mark uh, in about 1999. Um, you know, this was something which brought a lot of people together and focused a lot of people on some very interesting uh, topics. And I'm going to sort of talk about some of the trends and uh, aspects of this work. Um, ubiquitous computing, for those of you not in this field, this is um, looking at the world when there are literally thousands of computers around us embedded into everything we do and trying to figure out how to orchestrate those computers together in a way that uh, supports our work practices and improves our everyday lives in all aspects, including some of the humanitarian things that we've seen today. Um, all of these things have application. So um, ubiquitous computing. Um, today's world, you don't hear about it as much. In fact, the industry, or industry in general, has taken the term IoT, or the Internet of Things. And I think, you know, you could argue, you could nitpick it, there are some uh, differences between perhaps some of those visions, but I think they're basically the same thing. And, um, and moving forward, you know, the ideas, a lot of the, the interesting things which were in ubiquitous computing and was written about as part of the research can be applied in today's notion of what we think of as the Internet of Things. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the trends, um, talk about some challenges, uh, which I think is something that both uh, Gitano and Mark, um, you know, both of which I worked with very closely, and a great privilege to, uh, to you know, be part of their ideas and their, and their research agenda. Uh, we often use the sort of debate about what does it take to make some of these ideas successful. And uh, I think this, is a, this aspect of discovery and manageability is one of the challenges. And I'm going to talk about a solution, a possible solution, that shows a lot of promise, which we call the physical web, which is a combination of adding proximity to web technologies. Then I'm going to talk about how this applies to search, um, and I'll end. So both Katana and Mark would often put in their slides, uh, their slide decks, you know, what are the major trends in computing? And this slide would, would often appear near the start of one of their talks. So, you know, this is the observation that if the y-axis is uh, computers that have shipped per year. Uh, and you see about 1977, that was the peak of mainframe shipping. And then we moved, and that was, so that was like, you know, many people using a single computer. And then we, we moved to the one person to one computer paradigm, and that, that started taking off, and the, and the shipments went like crazy uh, through, you know, the late 80s and the 90s, um, uh, into 2000s and so on. And their prediction was that even that peak then, uh, would, would appear at some point, uh, it would peak at some point, and there'd be a new generation of ubiquitous computing which would come in in the years afterwards, and that would have its own hockey stick, and perhaps even there would be something after that, but uh, that was too far out. And the interesting thing is that today, some of those predictions are really coming true. Um, we certainly know that, obviously, computing is going to everything, but if you look at, uh, at, at Q4 2013, reported in 2014 here, global PC shipments fell for the first time ever by 10%. And obviously these things are slightly cyclic depending on what's going on in the industry and refreshes of PCs and so on. But this year that trend has continued. And uh, I just saw on the plane coming up, I saw this other report from Gartner and IDC that uh, PC shipments fell by 7%, maybe 9%, depending on uh, which uh, organization you look at. So look at this graph. Um, the blues are cell phones uh, going up to uh, shipments of about 2 billion uh, last year. The red is a fra the fraction of that that were smartphones. Um, if you like, you know, the most ubiquitous computer ever. Uh, last year shipping about 1.2 billion phones. And then the green uh, uh, peak there is laptops. And you can see, it, you know, marching on, obviously much smaller than than either cell phones or, or, uh, or smartphones, but it's just beginning to tail off uh, at 2013, 2014. So I think, you know, they, they were pretty good in their uh, assessment of, of how that is. Uh, it's actually turning out that way. And of course, the smart devices which are at the core of our computing today are laptops, tablets, smartphones, and even um, TVs in terms of things we spend 
time in front of. But the avalanche of smart devices is coming. Um, that almost anything you can think of is going to have computation added in, whether it's proxy, uh, proxy uh, information attached to things like uh, 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 posters or um, movie pictures, or whether it's uh, vending machines or things you have at home like smart uh, uh, thermostats, smoke detectors. Uh, there we've got a, a smart uh, basketball. Uh, which is connected to the internet and gives you advice about the angle of, uh, of throw, has an IMU inside, links back to the internet, and then gives you full advice about how to improve your basketball game. Absolutely amazing things that people are thinking about. Over there on the right, uh, a smart uh, sprinkling system that ties into knowledge about the plants that you have, and also the weather forecast to modify the sprink sprinkling strategy for your, um, for your garden. So, looks like we're going in the right direction. But one of the problems is that these solutions are very siloed. There's lots of companies making point solutions for these things. And it's not quite the ubiquitous computing vision that both Katana and Mark would talk about. And one of the issues that comes with siloing is that for each of those devices, there's typically an app. So as we move into the thousands of devices, you now have thousands of apps, potentially, on your phone. And so you're going to have your app bloat. How are you going to manage thousands of apps? It's clearly not going to scale. And then the other thing is, you walk into any environment, and potentially there are hundreds, maybe even thousands of things that you could connect to. How do you automatically discover and control these? How do you figure out what's useful to control? And then the IoT is also the internet on steroids, the internet plus plus. So how do you avoid overload? And also, how do you avoid all that spam and nefarious activity that's bound to carry on um, that we see in the internet, it's about to carry on in IoT. So it's an interesting challenge, and we think that a little part of that challenge can be solved by a new technology. Um, in the days when I worked with Katana, we focused on RFID a lot, but um, RFID has many issues. We often used to think about the cost of those devices to put on everything to identify them and to be able to interact with them. But they also had another problem, which we didn't take into account quite as much. The readers are really hard to get into a ubiquitous state. So how do you get a ubiquitous reader? And uh, our solution is that uh, there's a new radio technology, which I'll talk about in a second, which allows you to transmit a URL. And a device nearby, such as a phone, can run a browser, run a single app and receive those URLs, and then order them, and present it to you rather like an ordered list in a, uh, in a standard search, in a, in, a, in a web search. And then you have the ability to click on those things. And if you do it right, the signal strength can be used to order those things in roughly the things which are closest to you and things which are furthest away. So the thing you're standing in front of will be at the top of the list. The idea here is that you don't have to load anything. Your browser can be the thing which is already running on your smartphone, already running on your smart device. And so you, you already naturally have a way to walk up to anything and interact with anything. So this is the dream. So some background, why URLs? Why not just an ID, like they had an RFID, so you can identify things? Well, the thing about the web was it was a great democratization of the world in the sense that everybody had a, a fair playing field. There was no central server where all of your web quer queries go through. Um, DNS is the closest thing to being central a resolution of name to address. But in practice, um, uh, DNS is also a distributed and non-controlled entity. So everybody has a, has a fair shot. And in the Internet of Things, we're only going to see success in this if, we act, if everybody has a fair shot. And then there's the long tail effect of the web, is that, yes, there are some very popular websites, um, popularity being the y-axis here, products go to the right um, in terms of web pages that uh, satisfy niche uh, requirements or, or niche interests for people. Um, but there's a huge area under those tiny niches. And you can imagine there's going to be a huge number of small devices that you're going to want to interact with. But just once, just for one occasion, you're not, not going to want to install an app and then uninstall it afterwards. You'd just, you'd just be too much to deal with. So web pages have the ability to deal with this sort of niche content. So how are we going to control this avalanche, um, and how are we going to actually get it to be ubiquitous? Because that's the hard thing. Well, fortunately, the Bluetooth SIG created a new standard 
uh, in about 2010 called Bluetooth Low Energy. And it allowed us to create these things called low energy beacons. Beacons which uh, can run on a very, very small battery can be deployed ubiquitously. If your devices already have Bluetooth enabled uh, capability, then your device can also be configured to emit these beacons as well without actually having additional hardware, which is obviously the way you would, you'd want things to go eventually anyway. Um, the, the best thing about this is that at the same time, all the Bluetooth chip manufacturers started putting them into the smartphones. So now everybody's smartphone who's, that was made after about 2011 can read these things. It solves the reader problem that RFID had, and even things like NFC, which was another way of uh, another sort of niche of RFID, is that you know the problem with NFC is that uh, only a small percentage of phones have it. Maybe with Apple's recent announcements and uh, and their uh, i6 phone, that, uh, that that will improve. But all the same, NFC only works at short range. And here you have the ability to receive these beacons from a wide range around you and receive that information about what's in your locality, what's in your work area. Bluetooth, um, the Bluetooth SIG did some wonderful things with this spec, as, as far as I'm concerned as a, as a computer scientist. They created the ability to, for you to flexibly enhance their protocol. So they have a periodic ADV packet, the beacons that I've been talking about, and they allowed users to define their own um, packet payloads for a, a, very, a relatively small fee. You can get your own unique number which you can place in there, and then you can define the data which follows and have your own format. So it was our interest at uh, Google to define an open format based around transmitting URLs, and URLs can be compressed and then placed in those packets and then sent out periodically. It also, the standard also allows you to connect back to those devices. So if, you, if those devices don't have an internet connection and you can't control them through an internet path, you also have the ability to potentially connect to them directly. And if you start putting the library for connecting over BLE into web pages through a JavaScript library, then by loading the web page, which is associated with the URL, you then have the ability to interact with those devices directly. So this really does uh, create a game changer. And um, we started, we created libraries for these things, published the protocol as an experiment, not as a standard at this point, and put it out on GitHub for people to uh, experiment with. And we started seeing companies like this guy over here, the Blesh um, company, that, um, if I can just play this for you, short little video. <laughs> Basically, as you can see there, he gets back a result. In this case, it's just one, but there are lots of beacons around. And now um, he gets to see information about that particular event if he wants. And of course, this could be applied to vending machines and digital signage and all sorts of other things um, which are in the environment which he's in. So this sort of captured people's imagination, cap certainly captured uh, companies' imaginations. And uh, we started seeing this uh, moving forward, which is uh, the trick of things. But I, I wanted to sort of highlight as I finish on some of the, some of the key things which um, this opens up. So I talked about this being integrated with the web browser. And this, is, this of course, is, uh, is very important because it means that when you get your phone, you're obviously going to have a web browser on your phone. You automatically get this capability. And just as you search for things on the web, or you search more explicitly for images or videos, or other things, you could also imagine one of your tabs is search nearby. And nearby is the thing which gives you those lists of things. And furthermore, information in those searches can be interspersed, not just what's around you, but also other things that are relevant to those searches. So the whole ranking and ordering of what you get on a web page can now be affected by what's in the vicinity. Obviously, how you order that is, is, you know, is, is a tricky thing. Here's a little cool architecture of what's happening. You can see that a device which you want to label creates a, a beacon, has a URL. The URL could be just resolved on the mobile device, but of course, it's not going to be that useful. You really want to have snippets, you want to have a title, snippets, and so on. So what we'd probably do is send this to the equivalent of, of a search engine. You might say, aha, well, there's one company who's going to be controlling what's going on. But of course, the user can choose any kind of proxy search engine which can deal with these things they want. It's their choice. 
Um, and then, of course, once you, just, you actually choose something, you're going to get back your web page. It's going to have HTML. And one of the great opportunities these days is not only to have HTML, but also to have schema information. So schema I'll talk about in just a second. But first, I want to say that you know, the opportunities here for, um, if you like, the web of things, IoT and uh, things which are nearby, is that we can rank things according to um, the importance and, and bias things by what's nearby. We can use all the same tricks that we use with uh, search engines for filtering out what your, um, what's not useful. In other words, if we know there's a nefarious URL because the, now there's a nefarious beacon in the environment, we can filter that out or give you a warning that that's not a good thing to click on or even you know, demote it in the ranking order. Um, people can monetize this by uh, creating advertisements around that information. And also we can tie it in with the knowledge graph so that the information which is shown in the knowledge panels, which you get with many web searches, also has information which directly relates to the device which you're, you're trying to search for or trying to control. So this use of structured data um, is something which you're seeing more and more. If you, you know, if you open up a mail message, you might see there's some, something in there which is uh, a, 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 you know, a mail message about a particular event. And there, actually within the message, you have buttons which you can say, add this to my calendar, remove this from my calendar, or whatever. Um, in other words, you're now having metadata which is embedded in those pages which can cause actions. So those actions can also apply to the Internet of Things devices. So if it's a light, we can turn the light on and off with those buttons. Obviously, you want to have the appropriate authentication behind this as well. Um, so you may well have um, created a session cookie or something else which allows you that authentication. It has to be thought out very carefully. But at least this is the mechanism, and it's a standardized mechanism. It's something which people agree on, agree on which is the hard thing. You're trying to create this universal, ubiquitous framework which, um, which you want everybody to use. So the general reaction to this uh, concept has been very good. We've had lots of quotes from ZDNet and, and Gadget. And Gadget says, Google's physical web aims to make the internet things easier to use. And uh, Google's physical web project looks like looks to inject internet of things with more search. Um, and, and basically, we have been very, very pleased about the reaction to the experimental project. And then, uh, in July this year, um, we actually announced the official Google line on beacon formats. We created this thing called Eddystone. And Eddystone actually has three subtypes. Um, the concept of a UID, so basically an ID which is more of an enterprise solution um, for the Internet of Things. But very firmly in the center of this is that we have Eddystone URL frame format. And then finally, we also have something called telemetry, which allows us to monitor or allows people companies to monitor the state of their beacons in case the batteries need changing and so on. So, um, so this is beginning to uh, really take off. It has some momentum now. And these are all the vendors which are beginning to sell um, Edistone beacons. And, uh, and obviously, we, it's going to take you know, a year or two before we really know how well this takes off. But I think um, Gaetano and uh, Mark would be pretty excited that, um, that maybe this is one of the little Catalyst bringing together technology and the right frame formats and the, fri and the right uh, standards in order to create something which really does allow us to walk up to anything and use anything um, as we move into this really embedded world. And so and just the takeaway is that Edison URL is an enabling technology and it allows us, if you like, to make things smart and to universally access things which are around us. Integration with web and mobile and proximity and search is a really promising way to make this really useful in the same way that search is really useful. And then the physical web, which, we, which is the general name we give to this capability, um, allows devices to um, become smart and move the whole search uh, for IoT into ranking and filtering and knowledge, um, which will enhance the experience and make it safer to use the Internet of Things um, in the future. Uh, so I don't turn there. I don't know if it's time. Is the time for questions? Go ahead and take a question. Take a question. Okay. Uh, this is a very exciting world that we are seeing, uh, where everything is connected. But one thing that I see is that after this semantic battle, the knowledge of the coming from the data centralization. Um, 
when private companies come up with something like uh, central, uh, like some standards of connecting the stuff, uh, I see that there's a problem with the other companies have come up with something else and there's no standard that we can talk to on the same kind of like how we have WCC uh, WCC uh, how do you see that problem being solved in the physical lab and new app coming up? Well, the thing about all those products is that generally, although they have apps, they also have web pages, but they're usually difficult to get to or remember that they even exist. And this issue of semantic web obviously has plagued the web for, for a long time, but schema.org is an example of something that started very small, and it is catching on, and it's growing from a grassroots point of view, and people see the value in it. So, you know, as long as the browsers understand things like schema.org, then we'll see the growth of this. Uh, and I, I think we've had a lot of time, if you like, the dark ages of that not happening. I think the light really is uh, the end of the tunnel here. It's, it, if you look at the number of different uh, classes which Semantic Web is, uh, is allowing users to get to over time, you sort of see it's beginning to do one of these hockey stick things. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah.